The following program is sponsored by CBN. Today, a childhood house of horrors. I recall being in my mom's arms with her holding a butcher knife. And filled with deadly secrets. If I said something, something would happen to me or my family. How this prisoner of his past. I felt like I had become my father, which was the one thing I didn't want to become. Gets a supernatural glimpse of his future. I teleported like to a beach, hot sand. On today's 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club. I'm Wendy Griffith. An about face for Israel, the government will let Democratic Congresswoman Rashid Tlaib enter the West Bank after she promised she would not promote any boycotts against Israel while she's there. The move comes a day after Israel said Tlaib and Congresswoman Ilhan Omar could not come into the country because they support boycotts against it. Chris Mitchell brings us the story from Jerusalem. Today, Israel granted Michigan Democratic Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib's request to visit the country on humanitarian grounds to see her grandmother. That announcement came after Thursday's decision by Prime Minister Netanyahu, who said Israel had the legal and moral right to bar Tlaib and her fellow Democratic freshman Ilhan Omar of Minnesota. In a statement, he said, as a free and vibrant democracy, Israel is open to critics and criticism with one exception. Israeli law prohibits the entry into Israel of those who call for and work to impose boycotts on Israel, as do other democracies that prohibit the entry of people who seek to harm the country. U.S. President Trump had tweeted prior to Netanyahu's announcement. I think it would show a terrible sign. Uh, they want to do boycotts. They said horrible things about Jewish people. They said horrible things about Israel and Israelis. I think it would be a terrible thing, frankly, for Israel to let these two people who speak so badly about Israel come in. It was President Trump's tweet before the decision that many believe persuaded Netanyahu to bar the Congresswoman. Trump said that Israel would show great weakness if they allowed them in, even though a few weeks ago, Israel's ambassador to the U.S said that Israel would allow Omar and Tlaib to come in out of respect for the U.S. Congress. Both Omar and Tlaib hit back at Netanyahu. Omar accused Netanyahu of imposing a ban on Muslim women and added the decision was an insult to democratic values. One reason Netanyahu said they barred Omar and Tlaib's trip was because it was sponsored by MIFTA, an organization that supports the boycott divestment sanctions movement and has called suicide bombers part of the resistance movement. U.S. Ambassador to Israel David Friedman released a statement that noted 70 freshman members of Congress of both parties just completed a balanced visit to Israel, but said the Tlaib Omar delegation had limited its exposure to tours organized by the most strident of BDS activists. Democratic Congressman Ted Lieu accused Friedman on Twitter of dual loyalty, an accusation considered by many to be anti-Semitic. He later apologized and deleted his tweet. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thanks, Chris. In other news, President Trump says the U.S. has the hottest economy in the world. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John. Thanks, Wendy. The president tried to calm growing recession fears Thursday night at a New Hampshire Keep America Great rally where he went on the attack against Democrats. Gary Lane brings us the story. The economy took center stage as an optimistic President Trump assured New Hampshire supporters that their state and the U.S. economy remain strong. You have the best unemployment. You have the most successful state in the history of your state and in the history of our country. And then you're going to vote for somebody else? Oh, great. <laughs> Let's vote for Elizabeth Pocahontas Warren. A Fox News poll shows that Senator Warren is now the second choice of Democrats behind former Vice President Joe Biden to be their party's nominee to run against Trump. The president said it doesn't matter who the Democrats choose. Then he took a swipe at Biden. I think Sleepy Joe may be able to limp across the finish line. I think. But today they announced that they're going to cut way back on his appearances because 
He is such a disaster. The Hill reported Biden's allies have floated the idea of changing his schedule because he made so many gaffes in recent days. Trump told the crowd of 12,000 that we now have a bunch of socialists or communists to beat. And at this point, it may be an uphill fight for Trump. The same Fox News poll shows left-wing Democrats Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, and Kamala Harris defeating the president. Joe Biden would beat Trump by the widest margin, 50 percent to 38 percent. Regardless of early polls, the president says voters have to vote for him to protect the strong economy, even if voters don't personally like him. You have no choice but to vote for me because your 401ks, down the tubes, everything's going to be down the tubes. So whether you love me or hate me, you got to vote for me. The president discussed a wide range of issues, including China trade and gun control. In his first rally since the Dayton and El Paso shootings, the president said mentally deranged and dangerous people need to be institutionalized and taken off the streets. He said he's working hard to make sure guns are kept out of the hands of the mentally ill. But people have to remember, however, that there is a mental illness problem that has to be dealt with. It's not the gun that pulls the trigger. It's the person holding the gun. Gary Lane, CBN News. Thanks, Gary. Turning overseas, a deadly nuclear explosion in Russia last week was another sign the country is working to build up its nuclear weapons program. But as national security correspondent Eric Phillips reports, while Russia poses the greatest threat, it's far from the only one. Not only does this give America insight into what the Russians are doing, but it's also a reminder for the U.S. to not let up on its own nuclear development. Because while Russia poses the greatest threat, it is certainly far from the only one. This was the scene as five Russian scientists were laid to rest after last week's blast. They, along with two others believed to have been killed during testing of the Buravestnik cruise missile, dubbed Skyfall by NATO, it would be a tool in the Russians' nuclear arsenal unmatched by any other nation. Putin himself calling it a vengeance weapon that would fly lower, faster, and farther than any other. The danger that I see is that uh, having for essentially 25, even maybe 30 years, neglected our nuclear deterrent. Um, we are now potentially uh, not only considerably inferior to the Russians, but maybe even emboldening them. President Trump tweeted, the United States is learning much from the failed missile explosion in Russia. We have similar, though more advanced technology. But is U.S. technology in this area really better than the Russians? Gaffney doesn't think so. I fear that the president may have been sold a bill of goods here, that some of the work that we have in prospect to modernize our arsenal will be comparable, I'm sure, to that of the Russians. But it isn't in place now, and an awful lot of what they have is. The U.S. has now pulled out of the decades-old INF Treaty, and the Pentagon and NATO are trying to quickly develop systems that could fend off a Russian attack. And while Russia may be the biggest threat, former diplomat and Defense Department official Eric Edelman says it's clear they're not the only threat. Both Russia and China are investing in new nuclear weapons and new delivery platforms. There's also North Korea, the president so far unsuccessful in convincing dictator Kim Jong-un to shed nuclear weaponry. And Iran, which is busy enriching its uranium, priming it for development of nuclear weapons, a source of much contention between Tehran and the White House. Experts agree that the chances of nuclear war are slim, but with everyone seemingly ramping up, it's not out of the question. In your opinion, what is the likelihood that we could be heading for nuclear war? I don't think that uh, we certainly are going to start any nuclear wars. I don't think that uh, uh, as long as we are credibly deterring attack, that that's very likely. Experts are skeptical that Russia will ever be able to work out all the bugs where the so-called skyfall or doomsday weapon is concerned. And if it does, at what cost? The Kremlin still not confirming that the explosion was the result of testing the cruise missile, only saying in a statement, quote, accidents happen. In Washington, Eric Phillips, CBN News. 
Thank you, Eric. Well, Louisiana students will see the motto in God we trust on public school walls this year. Democratic Governor John Bell Edwards signed a measure into law last year requiring the national motto be posted in every public school after both the state house and senate passed it unanimously. It also requires students be taught about the U.S. flag and patriotic customs by the time they're in the fifth grade. Wendy, it sounds like they're going to be learning more lessons about Betsy Ross and the Stars and Stripes. I like it, and I know those folks down in Louisiana like it too. Well, thanks, John. Coming up, they call him the Renaissance Redneck, and his video blogs are taking the internet by storm. You can have fun, you can hunt, you can fish, you still love the Lord, and it's even better. <laughs> Head down to the Pungo Prairie to meet this hunter camper extraordinaire next. Hunting, camping, fishing, cooking, Bill Dixon is a connoisseur of outdoor adventure. His video blogs on Facebook and YouTube feature not only his passion for God's creation, but also his love for Jesus. Recently, I went to the Pungo Prairie to meet the man known as the Renaissance Redneck. Hey y'all, welcome to the Pungo Prairie. And we're gonna be hunting some of these legendary Saskatchewan Trophy whitetail bucks. So don't go nowhere, cause you don't wanna miss this. For more than five years, Bill Dixon has been serving up a delicious medley of recipes, outdoor adventures, and camping tips, sprinkled with a good dose of faith that has delighted fans of his video blogs. Now I'm gonna show y'all how to set up camp the Pungo Prairie Way. Pungo is a rural area of Eastern Virginia and the last place Dixon thought he would end up after his marriage ended. She was the love of my life. We were married almost 20 years and um, she just decided she wanted to do something different. And I always thought I was gonna be in the mountains at this stage in my life. Sure. God finally told me, Dixon, you're not gonna be in the mountains. You can go to the mountains. <laughs> But I'll give you the Pungo Prairie, so you gotta learn to bloom where you're planted. Some of that planting happened after Dixon flunked the fifth grade and had to repeat it at a Christian school. My mother, she kinda got worried about me. Uh, one day I was out in the yard and she was watching me and I came in the house and she said, Billy, are you, are you okay? I said, yeah, mom, I'm fine, why? She said, who are you talking to out there? I said, what do you mean? She said. I'm a little bit worried, but every time I look out, you're, you're like talking, your lips are moving. Oh, mom, I'm just praying. She said, you're praying? I said, yeah, Miss Glazebrook told me the Bible says to pray without ceasing. <laughs> now, the first thing we're going to do. For years, friends fly, begged Dixon to share his delicious recipes in a cookbook. But Dixon thought he could reach more people by video. I uh, made a uh, what you got chili <laughs> just out of what I had in the refrigerator in the pantry. It wasn't planned at all. And I shot a real quick impromptu uh, prompto video of that. And I said, that'll shut them up. Once they see that, I won't have to worry about it anymore. And they loved it. And then they were, you got to do another one. You got to do another one. Bill, you, you always say a blessing over the food. And why do you do that? I thought, OK, if I'm going to be doing this, let me, let me do it so that maybe People can see that you can have fun, you can hunt, you can fish, you can love the great outdoors, you can party, you can have a great time. You still love the Lord, and it's even better. And by little the subtleties of the Bible or God's minute sitting there in a scene in a clip and the blessing at the end. Lord, thank you so much. For maybe, just maybe that will, you know, grab the attention of somebody. Dixon says one of his videos did more than that. It helped save a life. And he said, I just want to let you know that you really kept me going for the last year while I was laid up a hundred and some odd days in the hospital battling two forms of leukemia. And him and his six-year-old son, they watched my the video Good Camp, which is a time-lapse thing of me sitting in my hunting camp up in the mountains of Virginia. And they just walked, and he said, and I just wanted to let you know how much I appreciated being able to go to watch your videos while I was spending that time in the hospital. And that really just blew me away. 
So Bill, right now, as I'm interviewing you, we are surrounded by several deer that I'm assuming that you shot and killed and ate and a very large buffalo. Can you tell us about this? Each one of these animals you see, um, I took and my daddy taught me early on, if you're going to kill something, make sure you're going to eat it. And I like knowing where my food comes from. Mm -hmm. And one way I know where my food comes from is where I go out and harvest it myself. Today, the man affectionately known as the Renaissance Redneck entertains as many followers on Facebook and YouTube and has no plans to stop. To me, there's two verses in the Bible that is almost all you need. And one's John 3.16. We know what that is. Yeah. And the other one, is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So if you accept Jesus and you act on that faith and then you believe Psalm 23 verse one, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Everything else comes together. And that girls and boys is what's cooking on the Pungo Prairie. I've been blessed to have a few meals down at the Pungo Prairie, and I can tell you there is no one that can do it better than Bill Dixon. And he even came to my wedding. So thank you, Bill. God bless you. Well, you can follow Bill Dixon's adventures at his website, the Pungo Prairie. Just go to our website, cbnnews.com, for a link. Up next, a man recalls the living nightmare that was his childhood. I recall being in my mom's arms with her holding a butcher knife, protecting us when he was trying to kill her, kill us. See how a supernatural vision frees this man from the cycle of abuse. Stay tuned. Brennan Wegener achieved the status of Warhawk for his excellence in fitness after he enlisted in the Air Force. It was the only time in his life that he ever felt any self-worth, but it was short-lived. Before long, Brennan was addicted to heroin, living on the streets and trying to hang himself with his own belt. I resented my father. I wanted nothing to do with him. I really don't have good memories of my father. That's because when Brennan Wegener was just a boy, he and his family were verbally and physically abused by his alcoholic father. I recall being in my mom's arms with her holding a butcher knife, protecting us when he was trying to kill her, kill us. I hated myself because of that. Um, I felt guilty and responsible for not protecting my mom or sisters. When Brennan was five, his dad and mom divorced, but the abuse continued. This time, he was molested by several babysitters, including a female relative. It left me feeling empty and broken inside. I was told it was my fault and threatened that if I said something, something would happen to me or my family. The abuse finally ended when Brennan was 12. His dad died and his mom remarried, and it wasn't long before he was addicted to opiates. So I snorted that, and that was when I felt complete peace and like everything had gone away, completely numb. Finally, Brennan decided his only chance to be free from drugs was to get away. At 18, after four years of addiction, he stopped using drugs and enlisted in the Air Force. I ended up becoming second since 1947 in fitness standards and became Warhawk status. I actually accomplished a lot. I was very proud of myself. I actually had some self-worth for once. For the next two years, Brennan would stay drug-free. In that time, he served a tour in Iraq. But one night while on leave, a man brutally attacked him at a bar for no reason, leaving him with a crushed mandible. After surgery, he was prescribed eight different narcotic medications that quickly refueled his drug addiction. At this time, I felt like I had become a failure again. Um, not only were the pain meds masking the physical pain, 
Now they were making all the emotional pain go away again and feeling that feeling of escape. Brennan married and later got medically discharged. He and his wife had two sons, but now he was turning into the person that hurt him the most. There was a lot of physical and verbal abuse on both ends. I felt like I had become my father, which was the one thing I didn't want to become. Um, it made me feel like I failed in life. Now, with no medical insurance or access to pain meds, he turned to heroin. My whole world changed. It sped everything up. It made my withdrawals quicker. I'd come down quicker. I'd need more, want more. Um, and it would hit you immediately so you could escape. Unable to hold down a job, Brennan eventually lost his marriage and ended up living on the streets. My self-worth was so low and I didn't care anymore that I felt more comfortable sleeping in cars and on park benches than being a part of my family. Then in 2012, Brennan was arrested and charged for heroin and weapons possession. He was released on probation. At this time, Brennan thought the only way to find peace was to take his life. Uh, the pain that led me to want to kill myself was having no self-worth, no purpose, and having absolutely no identity or reason to live. He would survive two suicide attempts in the coming year. Then an infection from a dirty needle landed Brennan in the hospital with septic shock. Although in critical condition for two and a half months, he survived. And they ended up stripping and removing um, veins in my arm. And the blood infection had gone into my brain and heart. While they're recovering, Brennan hanged himself with a belt. He says it was then God came to him in a vision. I teleported like to a beach, hot sand. It felt like somebody took a hot jar of honey and just poured it on the top of my head. And it went throughout my body into my fingers and toes. And when I looked up, it was the Lord basically with his hand on my head telling me that everything was gonna be okay. A group of nurses revived him and he woke up with a new perspective. What changed in my heart about God is that he was real, and that there was something out there bigger than myself, and that I had a chance. After a month of drug rehab, Brennan decided to go to a Christian rehab center in California. At a Saturday night worship service in March of 2016, Brennan walked forward at an altar call and surrendered all to God. I finally had made the choice to go up and surrender and at the altar that I was gonna give my life to him. The two biggest things for me was first repentance and then asking for forgiveness. I wanted a completely clean slate and I wanted to be forgiven and um, be able to live a happy, joyous, and free life. I was addicted to drugs and alcohol for almost 15 years, and it felt like God just had taken that all away. Brennan says as his relationship grew with Jesus, he was able to forgive all of his abusers, including his father. I realized that I've always had a father. Um, I didn't necessarily need an earthly or physical father. I've had a heavenly father. And for once in my life, that's all I feel I really need. Today, Brennan is newly married and enjoys being a father to his two sons. He now knows his identity in Christ and the heavenly father who gave it to him. God is a savior. God is a redeemer. And he is my rock and he is everything. My identity in God is I am free. I am no longer a slave and I am a child of God. Maybe you're like Brennan, you feel like you've been a failure in life, that there's no hope, there's no purpose, you know, what's the point? Well, you're wrong. You couldn't be more wrong because God sees you, He loves you, He made you, and He has a purpose. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, God says, I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. There is a future. There is always a future and hope with God. You haven't messed up so bad that you can't have a second, a, a second act. God is the God of second chances. 
I know. And there's many of you watching right now that know that as well. So I just want to give you hope today. And if you've never received Jesus, if you're, if you're saying, hey, Brennan was trying to kill himself and God came to him in that moment and rescued him because God is a rescuer and he loves you and he will rescue you and turn your situation around. I want you to pray with me right now because I know someone is watching right now and you need to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior because you have tried everything else and nothing has worked. So just bow your head with me right now and pray. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me, God, of everything that I've done. Give me a new heart and a fresh start and I will live for you all of my days. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you just pray that, you become a Christian. You're a new creature in Christ, and we want to help you in your journey. We have something for you. It's called A New Day. This is our gift to you. It's absolutely free. All you need to do is give us a call right now, and our counselors are standing by to talk to you. 1-800-700-7000 is the number to call, or you can log on to cvn.com. And this is an exciting day. It's called A New Day. Uh, A new day will dawn on us from above because our God is loving and merciful, and he cares for you. Well, still ahead, we take you to the hills of Kenya, where reporter Dan Rainey is living the life. Herding cattle. Seemed easy. Little harder than it looks. I lost them, like the whole herd. (laughs) Watch Dan experience a day in the life of a Maasai family, coming up later on today's 700 Club. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. A carnival ride inside a church in the UK is drawing a mixed response. Leaders at Norwich Cathedral in eastern England hope the 50-foot ride will attract people and show off the cathedral ceiling. Canon Andy Bryant says it allows people to sit inside the Word of God and and get a walking tour of salvation. Dr. Gavin Ashenton, former chaplain of, uh, to the Queen, doesn't like the idea, though. He told the Telegraph newspaper it's blasphemous, saying people have paid with their lives to believe in Christ, and the cathedral is a corporal embodiment of Christ. Well, CBN's Operation Blessing has provided a new home for a single dad in Peru. Juan Carlos is raising four children and running a small snack chip business, but he was barely making ends meet, and their home was falling apart, and Juan Carlos couldn't afford to fix it. That's when Operation Blessing stepped in to help. Juan and his family were gifted a brand new safe home, and Juan also received a new snow cone cart so he can expand his business. Well, you can find out more about Operation Blessing by visiting ob.org. Wendy will be back with more of today's 700 Club right after this. Welcome back. Well, in a remote part of Kenya, villagers herd cattle with spears. That's for protection against lions and other wild animals. Our own Dan Rainey tried his hand at herding on a visit to see how the people called the Maasai live. Take a look. I'm Dan Rainey, reporter producer for CBN. I have a master's in anthropology and I travel the world, bringing back stories of the good CBN does in people's lives. I want to go deeper with people to better understand their struggles as they fight to survive one day at a time. When the plane landed in my Saimara, I was greeted by the vast array of wildlife that helped make this relatively untouched part of Kenya famous. I soon arrived at a nearby Maasai village and was welcomed by the students of a school built and supported by CBN's Orphan's Promise. Village life here is peaceful. Children go to school, mothers tend to their homes, and men take the cattle to graze. That day, I met up with Olanasi and his family. Nice, thank you. Maasai don't have uh, shepherd's crooks, they have spears, because we have lions here. I constantly whistle so the wild animals know I'm around. It keeps them away. Herding cattle. Seemed easy. Little harder than it looks. I lost them. 
Like the whole herd. Found him. As we were herding, Olanasi and I talked. Before CBN came here, we had to go very far to get enough water for our cattle and ourselves. I lost 50 of my cattle during the drought. I had terrible pains in my stomach because of sickness from the dirty water. At one point, I was too sick to take my cattle out, so my wife had to do it. That day, lions came and killed two of my cattle. I was afraid I would be the next victim. I climbed the tree and called for help until some men came and chased the lions away. After that, I never looked after the cattle again. Olanasi and I walked over fields and through thick brush to where they used to collect water. CBN drilled a deep well right by the old source. Now, even during drought, they have enough water for the entire village and all their cattle. So the old water source and the new water source are really side by side. Those solar panels are pumping fresh, clean water all the way up to the village. Now in the old days, they used to collect water here from this open, open spring, and they shared this with animals. So this is not water you would ever want to drink. Whenever I went for water, I was afraid lions would be there drinking. The water was very far away. We'd go through the wilderness to get there, and on the way, we'd meet with wild buffalo and elephants. Because of your help, we have many cattle again. Since the taps are so close to the village, people can now fetch water anytime they want, without fearing the wild animals. Before, we only bathed once each week. Now we can bath whenever we want. You know, I've done this water routine before, but I can see the village from here and I know this is fresh, clean water, so this is a piece of cake. Having water so close has changed everything. Now, even the children can fetch water. After bringing in the cattle, they showed me how they craft that elaborate jewelry. Making a big bracelet takes about two weeks. It's a Maasai tradition to dress as we do. Some like wearing more than others. You cannot wear the traditional clothing without the beads. You have to look shiny. With more time on their hands thanks to the well, the ladies make more jewelry to sell in the market, ensuring a steady flow of income for their families. We are so happy. The support we received is so important. Everyone in the village benefits from the projects. As a born-again Christian, I know that it was God who gave us the well and the school. Before the school was built, classes were held under a tree. Our books blew in the wind, and when it rained, we stayed home. We were taught about God under the tree, so we prayed and asked God for a church, a school, and water. Now all those prayers are answered. At night, when the children have gone home, the chores are done, and the cattle are resting, parents come to the school, one by one, to learn how to read and write themselves. It's something they never had the opportunity to do before. My life has changed. I can write one to a hundred. This means I can walk to the bank, write my own name and my numbers, and withdraw my money without any help. In the beginning, it was hard for me to use a pen on a book, but now it has become so easy. When my mom comes back from class, she asks me questions about the things she didn't understand. I explain things and help her. I am so proud of her. With water from the well, we also started a vegetable garden outside the village. As the women of the village tend the garden, children come from the school to learn all about agriculture. Some of the crops are used to feed the kids at school. The village gets all the rest. It's a different way of life for the Maasai, but one that was necessary for their survival. <laughs> During the famine, there was not even any milk. The cows dried up and died, and there was always sickness and death. Now everyone is healthy, and disease is a thing of the past. As the day drew to an end, the men of the village showed me how they make fire. Yeah. 
It's happening so fast. I thought we would be here like two hours. I see smoke already. <laughs> then it was my turn. This is why they do it as a demonstration and don't let other people like try with them. There's a little smoke. Well, I'm getting there. Yes, it is harder than it looks. Has it been two hours yet? I'm not even anywhere close, am I? <sighs> well, we got the fire started without much help from me at all. We're getting ready to get the party started. In honor of my visit on behalf of CBN, the warriors of the village danced and sang long into the night. We roasted a goat over the open fire, and we all ate until we were full. I didn't want the night to end, but eventually it was time to sleep. I went inside, passed the goats and the chickens, and turned in. Long day, but a good day. They've got their spare room set up for me, so I think I'm going to sleep pretty hard tonight. Oh. Early the next morning, it was time to say our goodbyes. Oh, thank you, I am so happy that Dan came to visit us, and I am grateful for all that CBN has made happen in our village. God be with you wherever you go. I thank God for what he has done, and I thank him for your coming here. You have changed our lives. As I drove away, I took in the sights and sounds of Kenya one last time. I left with a sense of peace, knowing the families here have hope for a brighter future. Thought we were going to lose Dan to the Maasai tribe there for a while. He was enjoying it so much. But if you're a CVM partner, you helped that village with new schools, with water, life-saving water, with churches, with homes, with everything that you saw, and so much more. If you'd like to be a part of helping hurting people all over the world and making life better, it's so easy to do. We invite you right now to go to our, go to our phones, 1-800-700-7000, or go to your phone and call our number. Uh, again, 1-800-700-7000, and just say, yes, I want to join the 700 Club. It's just 65 cents a day, $20 a month is all it takes to become a CBM partner. When you do that, we want to give you something called Power for Life. This is when you sign up for Pledge Express. That's where your bank does all the work, and it comes out automatically, no hassle, no stamps, no checks. Uh, it does all the work for you, and we want to bless you with Power for Life. This is a teaching by Gordon and Pat that you'll get every single month that will really encourage your faith. So give us a call right now. Well, still ahead, he was a wildly successful Hollywood set designer with a boatload of gay pride. I was at Fashion Week and I just thought, I can't do this anymore. Like, this isn't going to cut it anymore. Find out why he had a change of affection when he joins us live later. Swimming in Drew Barrymore's pool, vacationing at Diane Keaton's getaway home, going to the Grammys for Rocking Paris or, or Rocking Paris Fashion Week. This was the lifestyle of Beckett Cook, and he absolutely loved it until the day he suddenly didn't. Beckett Cook was living what many today would consider the dream life. He was a successful set designer in the fashion world and mingling with Hollywood's elite. He was also openly gay yet it still wasn't enough. So I was at Fashion Week and I went to all the part. I went to all the shows, to a bunch of the parties, and I was at a party one night and I just, I just kind of looked over the crowd and I just thought, I can't do this anymore. Like, this isn't gonna cut it anymore. In his book, A Change of Affection, Beckett shares how God turned his identity upside down and brought him the kind of peace and freedom that he never knew was possible. Please welcome to the 700 Club, Beckett Cook. Beckett, great to meet you. Good to meet you. I'm just loving your book, A Change of Affection. It's very powerful. Thank you. Well, tell us what happened to you. You were just 10 years old, completely innocent, over at your friend's house for a sleepover, as you often were. Mm -hmm. But that night was different. What happened? Well, I, in the middle of the night, I was awoken by my friend's father and he was molesting me wow. and it was it was very shocking and uh, scary because i i had this kind of image in my mind of if i didn't 
kind of allow him to do what he was doing, I had this image of him with a knife, like mm -hmm. that he was going to stab me or kill me. Yeah. So it was this very... Because it was evil, what was happening. Yeah. Then he came back a couple of different times. Yeah, then he, he left the room and like came back, tried to do stuff again, and I kind of resisted. He left the room, came back one more time, and that's when I was sitting up in bed, and, and, I, and he said something weird like, oh, I just wanted to see if you needed a fan or something. Yeah. And I said, no, no, I'm okay. Yeah. But that was a very scary night. And you never told, well, you told one friend, but you yes. didn't tell anybody. Why didn't you tell anyone? I didn't tell my parents because I knew that my father probably would have had him killed. My father was a really powerful attorney in Texas. And yeah. so I was like, I don't want my father going to prison over this. Um, so I, you were the youngest of eight children, uh, yes. and you didn't want all your siblings to be fatherless. And right, so really and also I didn't want people to know. You know, it was kind of a it's it was a very oh, kind shame. of shameful yeah. experience, and I didn't want it to get out to you know people. Well, Beckett, how do you think that night affected your sexuality later on? Well, for many many years, uh, as a gay living as a gay man, I never really thought it affected me. Yeah. Um, I just kind of denied that it, that it affected me because I didn't want my sexual identity as a gay man to be tied to such a scary, yeah. weird, gross well, night. Yeah. But after I became a Christian, I realized that night had a huge impact mm -hmm. on my sexuality and where I kind of ended up going. You think that that was the door that was open? I think it was, yeah. I think that kind of cemented it. Then all through uh, grade school, high school, uh, you were very popular with the ladies and you went to all the dances uh, and you kind of liked that. Yeah, I was you, very social, yeah. But you weren't attracted to them. You, you, no. you were still, you realized you were attracted to boys. Yeah, I was attracted to the same sex and, and uh, since I was, since that night, since I was young, yeah. So I, So you, you lived know. this dual life and you thought it was kind of cool for a while. Um, and then you, when did you decide or why did you decide to fully embrace the gay lifestyle eventually? Well, eventually, I mean, I, in high school and in college, I had gay best friends and I was able to explore my sexuality and I went to gay bars and explored that whole life. And, yeah. and I kind of felt like, oh, like this is home for me. These are my people. But it wasn't until um, after college when I had my first relationship with a, a guy, we fell in love and that's when homosexuality as my identity became fully, I embraced it in fully. And so I came out to my family, I came out to my parents, I came out to everyone after college. Did they freak? <laughs> they didn't freak. Um, my parents were actually quite lovely about it. And again, it's, I mean, I was the youngest of eight kids. So okay. by the time they got to me, they were kind of <laughs> like, retired. oh, you're gay? Okay, cool. <laughs> no, my, I mean, my parents were Christians and they were, you right. know, they believed it was a sin. And sure. But they were they were very sweet and very loving about it. They didn't kick me out of the house. There was no dramatic scenes. Um, they were just kind of like my dad. I remember my father asked me, you know, did I did I do anything wrong? Like, did I? Are you angry at me for anything? And and I said, no, dad. Like, I'm fine. This is who I am. I'm gay. Like, don't worry. It's not your fault. And so, what were your relationships with men like? I mean, sometimes you were in a serious relationship, and sometimes you weren't, right? Yeah, I was in uh, over the years in L.A. I was in five serious relationships when, with guys. When did you begin feeling, okay, something's empty? You you even said in your book. You felt dead inside. I was at Paris Fashion Week in March of 2009. I used to go to Fashion Weeks in New York and Paris. And I was at this party, an after party. It was very glamorous. Everyone from the fashion world was there. I think Kanye was there. <laughs> and um, I just remember looking out over the sea of people. And I had done everything. I'd been to every party, been to every... I traveled the world, been to so many different things, so many dinner parties at mm. like movie stars' houses. And... and I, so that night in Paris, I just was looking out over the crowd and I thought, this is not it. This is not the meaning of life. What, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? Maybe you this... had the life every, you thought everybody wanted. But what happened? One day you were having coffee at your favorite coffee spot and you saw these people with Bibles, which you never had seen in 10 years at this particular spot. What happened? Well, they, I saw, yeah, that was a shock. And I, they, this group of people... 
we ended up in a, my best friend and I ended up in a conversation with them, and they invited me to their church the following Sunday in Hollywood. And I said, well, what does your church believe about homosexuality? And they said, well, we believe it's a sin and blah, blah, blah. And because I had that night in Paris where I felt so empty, yeah. I was just kind of open to that. Absolutely. And they invited me to church. I went the following Sunday. What um, happened when you were sitting there listening to that sermon and then especially after the service was over? So I, yeah, while I was listening to the sermon, everything the pastor was saying, preaching out of Romans chapter seven was resonating as truth in my mind and my, my heart. And I didn't know why. I was like, this is true. This is true. I was all, literally on the edge of my seat the whole sermon for an hour. And then after the sermon, this guy on the side of the church prayed for me. I came back to my seat and I was processing the sermon, the music, the worship music and, and everything. And then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just like overwhelmed me. And God was like, I'm God, Jesus is my son, heaven's real, hell's real, the Bible's true, you're now adopted into my kingdom, welcome. And I was like, ah! and I just started bawling and bawling and bawling. And it was like the, the curtains had just parted and I could see the truth for the first time in my life. I knew the meaning of life for the first time in my life. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. What did you do about your homosexuality at that point though? Well, I knew, I, it's funny, because I knew instantly, I knew in that moment, that this was no longer who I was, mm. being gay was not who I was, and that that was, it was over, I was done with it. I wish we had more time. The book is amazing. It's called A Change of Affection. It's available wherever books are sold. You need to get a copy of it. Well, we leave you with these words from Romans 12, 12. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Beckett Cook, God bless you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you, Wendy. And thanks everybody for watching. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.